I used to be very uncomfortable with this term guru because it kind of makes me like, whoa, that, that's weird. But then, then I went to India and then the people there told me that uh, guru just means teacher. I'm like, oh, okay, sure, great. Guru is fine. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about focus. Uh, how many of you um, catch yourself saying or feeling, I don't have time? Hand up. Yeah, that's about every, <laughs> every hand. Uh, that, that's the failing test. Um, I hope by the end of the talk, we'll ask again and maybe it'll be half as many hands and then we've got green light and then it's been a successful talk, all right? You with me? Okay. The thing is, I, I get that question, I get, I, get a, um, I get this question quite a lot. Henrik, how do you find the time? How do you find the time? Like, oh, you got like, you got four kids and you're doing talks and you're writing books and doing all this stuff. How do you find the time? And I thought about that for quite a bit. And if you think about it, it's, it's a bit of a weird question, right? Like what? Oh, look, there's some time right there. I found it, right? <laughs> how, how, much time, how much time do you have? 24 hours per day, right? It's really simple if you think about it. Um, time is the most fairly distributed even, and most predictable resource in the whole world, and it's free. You get 24 new, fresh, empty hours every day. They're just being thrown at you, right? All you have to do is decide what to do with it. You can sit around and do nothing, and you'll get another hour, an hour later, right? It's, it's, it's magical. Um, and it's free. Time is free. It's, time isn't money. You do nothing, and you get more time showing up. Until one day you wake up dead, and then it doesn't matter because you won't miss it, right? <laughs> so um, 24 hours per day, what's that, 176 per week or something like that, or per, per, per week and then per month, what's that, I wrote it, I wrote it up, it's uh, 8,700 8, hours per year, free, just being thrown at you, and about six or 700,000 uh, uh, per life, depending on um, your habits and your, and your luck, right? <laughs> so the, the real question is, and how do you find the time? It, it's really, what, what the heck are you gonna do with all this time, right? So that's the, the, the theme of the talk. And, um, Someone, I forget who, I think it was Martin Abel was talking about hacking your life yesterday. It's a little bit on that theme because gradually I've, I've started looking at time in a different way and that's in a very literal sense changed pretty much everything about my life. It's, it's almost like, like, like a, a matrix moment when, when I realized that, wait a sec, there's no lack of time, there's lots of time. What the heck am I gonna do with all this time? It's just, just another way of look, looking at the world. But let's, let's uh, rewind a bit. Um, I learned from, uh, Jerry Weinberg, who was mentioned yesterday, I consider him my absolute most important mentor in life. He has just this wonderful um, way of looking at things. And what he, what he told me was, your biggest strength is also your biggest weakness. I'm like, okay, that sounds kind of, hmm, wait a sec. But actually he's right, I think. Um, for me, one of my strengths is, is passion. I tend to get really engaged in, in whatever I do. But if you get really engaged in whatever you do, there's a downside, right? And what's the downside? You can get disengaged and everything else, yes, but you can also get stressed, right? You get, can get over-engaged, over so that's always my problem. So I'm always wrestling with this, with this tendency to get um, over-engaged in things. So let's, let's rewind. Uh, year 2000, so I'm, I'm, I'm in a dot-com startup. It was just me and three other founders. I was the tech guy. And what happens to the tech guy when, it, when, they, when the company grows? Well, the tech guy hires more tech guys, and suddenly the tech guy is a manager, <laughs> right? And it's like, what just happened? Now I'm a manager, shit, how do I do this? So I was being a manager for, for years without understanding that there is a thing called management and a thing called leadership, right? <laughs> really interesting um, and stressful, but kind of fun. Problem is I had my hand in the code still, right? And I was kind of the, the technical bottleneck person and trying to be a manager, which really sucks. So I realized that I have to get my hands out of the code. Um, and I managed that after a while, maybe after half a year of, of being a bottleneck, I, real, I managed to get out and cool, I'm not the bottleneck. I can be a leader full time. Cool, now I'm gonna be a great leader, right? I'm sitting at my desk, wow, I'm gonna be a leader. Now what do I do? <laughs> but then something really weird happened. Um, I noticed that something had gone wrong in my head because I couldn't make decisions anymore. People would come to me and say, hey, Henrik, um, you know, any, any, here, could you just sign this invoice? I'm like, uh, should I sign it? Should I really be signing? What, what, what if you sign it yourself? Or do we, you know, what? I just got caught up on, on small decisions, day to day decisions. Um, are we going to start this project or not? Just all these little things. Um, it was really weird. It's like I couldn't make decisions. I would get really stressed for small, silly decisions. Um, I talked to someone in, in my team about it, and I was really lucky because this person had been through an experience which was really scary. He told me that he had been, like five years earlier, uh, been an entrepreneur running a company. 
Um, and then one day, and he, it was really stressful, but also really uh, exciting and interesting. One day he passed out, he just passed out. Um, and he was carried to the hospital and he couldn't, he couldn't talk, he couldn't, eat, he couldn't even eat. They gave him um, intravenous food like that. He lost his family, he lost his job. He was gone, right? Total burnout. After about a year, he started coming back slowly. So he had to reboot his whole life. And, and what, what he told me was, when I described these symptoms, he said, Henrik, that's the last step. That was the last thing that happened to me before I passed out. I was like, shit, <laughs> now I was scared. Um, and I realized I'm heading for this wall at like breakneck uh, pace. So I decided to just stop. I told my team, I'm gonna take a break, a long break. I don't know how long. I'm not gonna check my e email, I'm just gonna be gone. So who wants to be CTO? So, okay, <laughs> go for it, good luck, right? Uh, I talked to the, to the board of directors, said the same thing, uh, um, I need to take a break. They were really good about it. They realized that the alternative is, is a burned out Henrik and what's the benefit of that to anybody? So I just went home and I slept. And I slept and I slept and I slept and I was like this, this, uh, um, uh, this zombie figure, right? Um, wake up, put on my robe, wander around, eat some food, go back to sleep again. It was a really weird state to be in. Um, and after a couple of months of just being this kind of vegetable, not as bad, a, not, not, not as, bad as, as, as my friend who had totally crashed, right? I was functioning, but very much down. Um, I started getting like a little impatient. I'm like, oh, hmm, I'm starting to feel a bit kind of, yeah, bored. I want to do something now. I'm starting to feel a bit stronger. So uh, I started gradually going back to work, although I didn't want to be CTO again because that job is quite stressful. You've got a lot of different things to do. So I was like, I'm going to start carefully. I'm going to be a project manager. Felt a little bit easier. <laughs> uh, I get to focus on one thing. So I came in and I was a project manager for this technical thing. And what surprised me was what I saw when I came back. It, what I saw was uh, an army of zombies around me. I looked around, I just saw tired people. And I felt like Superman. I was so focused. I came in and I was like, I could, you know, in three to four hours, I'd be done with what, what would have been maybe two, three days work normally. And I could like go home. It was amazing the amount of stuff I got done in no time at all. And I felt completely calm. It was like this Zen thing, right? I could come in and just, just, just rule the world. And around me, I just saw tired people that I really felt sorry for. And, and, and that's when I realized that, okay, burnout, it's not a binary state. Right? Often it's described as oh, you're, you're either fine or you're burned out. But I realized, no, uh, I think most people are in some kind of a semi-burnout state. Um, do, do you recognize that? Hand up if you, if you recognize that. Right? Yeah, that. That's a lot of hands. Um, so that was a really big aha for me, that you can really get a lot more, more work done um, in, in, in less time if, if you really rested. Okay, so let's fast forward a bit more. Uh, a few years later, I'm <laughs> back in the hot seat. I'm, I'm interim CTO at, 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 a, at a game company. I don't know, I must have not learned any lessons along the way. I'm, so I'm in this company, um, and when I come in, there's my team, my group is, is 40 people developing gaming systems, and they were completely crashing. When I came in, I was, again, really surprised, like, wow, look at this, they're really crashing, they've built a system that, that doesn't really work, and, and people have been, been burning, uh, burning out, the platform was crashing every day. Um, in fact, on my third day at, at work, we crashed on, on live television, the National Swedish Poker Tournament, right? <laughs> crashed, and it was our fault, right? So we were, you know, the people were talking about us in, in, the, in, the, in the news, and it was like really horrible way of starting a new job, right? It's like, oh shit, what are we gonna do? Um, and uh, uh, I started interviewing people, what, what, what needs to happen? And what they told me was, anything can happen. Anything you do will be a change for the better. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Well, that's a vote of trust, if anything. I had learned about Scrum a little bit. This was somewhere around 2004, 2005. I, I'd heard about Scrum. I, I was experienced with XP, because I'd been using that for a long time in my own companies, but Scrum was something I heard about. It seemed to kind of fit this context. So I, I started asking, like, wh who's needed to fix this problem? We have this burning platform, and it's crashing every day, and still we're trying to build new stuff all the time. How are we going to solve this? So like, who, who is needed to, to solve this? Who can fix the problem? And I learned quite quickly that if we, if we can just get these five or six people, they really know what needs to happen. They're just not being, a, being given a chance to do it. So we did an experiment. We said, hey, how about you, you guys become our first real scrum team? We'll move you to the back of the room here, far away from the door, right? You'll be, you'll be in the back here, and you'll be doing scrum, pretty much by the book. The rest of you, 20, 30 people, do whatever you want, but protect them. 
Just keep any noise out of, out, out, out of their way. If I'd known about Kanban at the time, I would have suggested that, right? But th this was like a, a, a physical human buffer, keeping the noise out from this, this team. And then what I did was make sure there's no new stuff coming in, like, like no, no new features being developed. We told all our customers, we're going to do nothing for you until we solve this problem. Which means that now suddenly we have a bit of time for, for, for fire prevention instead of just firefighting. So we did that, and also I told people to stop doing overtime. So I realized this doesn't make sense. I come to work, everyone is there. I go home from work, they're all still there, and they're really tired and unproductive. It felt wrong, right? Um, for me as a manager to be working half the amount of hours as everybody else. So finally I just said, screw it. Overtime is forbidden. No more overtime. Go home at five. I kick started kicking people out of the office pretty much. And I was really surprised at what happened. The reason why I did that was pretty much for ethical reasons. This is just wrong, right? Who cares about the product? We can't burn people out. But I was really surprised what happened. Within, within a few months, people were pretty calm. They were delivering better stuff. They were delivering it faster. They were having more fun, right? We had gotten rid of the notion of having a buffer of people. We just had scrum teams. We had still some firefighting, but so little firefighting that it could be just left, each team could leave a little buffer for firefighting. So within a few months, it was like a total turnaround. And I was like, wow, again, I see this. The same people doing the same kind of work, but they're doing more work, better work in, in less time. And I keep see, seeing, that, seeing, that, seeing that pattern. It's, it's really fascinating. All right. So um, after that engagement, it was an interim role. I was there for about one and a half years. I came out of there. I was home one weekend and I was sick, not burnout, just, just a bit of fever, right? It happens sometimes. I was lying in bed, um, but, but my brain was awake. So I was lying in bed thinking like, ah, that was interesting. I learned so much. Um, I should write some down. I'm lying here in bed anyway. I might as well write some stuff down. So I grabbed my computer, started typing. I couldn't stop, right? <laughs> I just kept typing, like, what the heck? This was, I started digging around in my old photos, and like, oh, that was interesting. We did this, we did that. Wow, we learned so much. I started writing, I couldn't stop. I wrote like a you know, madman for three days. I was lying in bed, I was just writing, 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 sleep. Write, 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 eat some food, sleep. Write, 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 crazy. Um, after about three days, I was like, what is this? It's a 70-page article. What am I gonna do with it, right? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't have a blog, I'm, well, you know, it's, it's, it's too long to be an article, well, what am I going to do with it? I put it up on some mailing list and people started telling me, hey, this is really interesting, you should, you should. it's really, it, it's amazing, when I start reading it, I can't stop reading it, it's just a single like, train of thought. I'm like, oh, maybe because that's how it was written, right? <laughs> it's a single train of thought. But anyway, um, uh, people convinced me to turn it into a book, although it's a very short book. This one from about 10 years ago, Scrum and X3 from the Trenches, I had no idea at the time what the heck was going on in the world. I didn't know there was such a thing as an Agile conference, for example. I hadn't heard of it, right? I missed the memo. Right? But um, what happened was this little book went absolutely viral, and I started being called by a lot of people like, hey, you know, uh, we have a similar situation, and, and you seem to be a Scrum expert. I'm like, what? Oh, 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 okay, because it says Scrum and my name is there, then I'm an expert, right? <laughs> this is my beginner's journey. <laughs> so, but suddenly I was an expert, and people were called for help. I started getting curious about the why behind, right? Because, okay, Scrum kind of worked, but why did it work? And sometimes it doesn't work, why doesn't it work? So I started getting interested in things like, like, like lean and systems thinking and other areas uh, close to Scrum, such as Kanban. Um, and I started meeting a lot of companies, started getting around, meeting a lot of companies. And I noticed this very interesting pattern, which I'm going to try to illustrate using sticky notes. It's, it's a pitfall that happens both in your own head, in my own head, and in your teams and in your companies. I'm going to use a very silly example. Are you ready? <laughs> so here's me, and my job is to build smileys, all right? I spend the first day developing a smiley. That's how far I get. Pretty complex smileys. Next day, can you see this in the back more or less? Good, I see one thumb. <laughs> Right, next day I get, get a bit further and here the smiley is done. Great, I can deliver it. Cool? All right. And then I start working on the next smiley. We got the pink customer who wants a smiley. Start working on it one day. And then the next day over here like that. And finally, done. Okay. And what I do next? Well, I'm a smiley creator, right? So I create more smileys. There's a customer yellow who wants a smiley. So sure, go ahead. Um, there. Looks good, right? Three smileys, designed, delivered, tested. All right, let's rewind. And let's say I have a different situation or a different personality. I start working on my smiley here. 
like that, right? And um, wait, that's the wrong pile. Is this pile? I start working on my smiley, and suddenly customer Pink says, "Hey, how's my smiley going?" And I'm like, "Oh, don't worry, I'm working on it. Don't worry, I'm working on your smiley." And I'll start working on Pink, right? And then comes customer Yellow and says, "Listen, I really, really need my smiley. It's very urgent. Please start working on it right now." Okay, okay, sure, I'm working on it. There. Now I can tell all three customers, "Don't worry, I've started your project." <laughs> right? It's great. They're in progress. Green flag. <laughs> I should love that green flag thing, yeah. Okay, and then I go back to working on the orange one, and then, I, of course, now the, the, the pink uh, customer is getting a bit stressed and wondering where the heck is my stuff. Don't worry, I'll get right to it. And you see the pattern, right? It just goes on like this and like that. And finally, oh, I got done. There's a orange smiley right there, see it? Right? And ah, I got done with pink, finally, and I got done here, right? Okay, what's the difference? Everyone got their smileys la later, except the last one. That's one difference. If, let's take pink. Pink is, the, is the, the, the middle example, right? Notice that pink started later here and finished earlier, right? And down here, pink started early and finished late, right? That's what we mean by stop starting and start finishing, right? Because if you just focus on starting things, things take forever. But there's an interesting thing here. What about productivity? How would you rate the productivity in these two different situations? First one is higher. Actually, I would say they're the same because look, in this amount of time, we produced three, three, three faces, right? In real life. Well, let's get to real life in a moment. This is just uh, <laughs> sticky notes, right? The time to market is two to three times slower here, right? Same person doing the same amount of work. Time to market two to three times slower. Whenever I start something until it finishes it, two to three times longer. But the productivity is about the same because in this amount of time, I finished three things, right? But something's missing. What's missing in this model? Context. Context switch. And I did that deliberately because look, even this person who is like a robot, this is Mr. Perfect Context Switcher, right? It has zero context switching time. Even that person is two to three times slower. Isn't that kind of interesting? Mathematically, two to three times slower. There's nothing you can do to get around it. You don't, you, you don't get to violate math, right? So even a perfect multitasker is going to be two to three times slower here, just because I couldn't say no and wait. Right, so let's add the more realistic version of this. Let's say we're not perfect multitaskers, which we aren't, by the way. And in complex work like software, multitasking or the task switching cost is quite high, right? So here's me focusing on the, on the orange one, right? And now I've got to switch to the next project. So there's going to be a gap here, right? And I work on the next one. And there's another gap. I've got to switch context, find the new customer, set up the environment, understand what they need, etc. There we go. A little more realistic, right? And I know that you know where this is all heading, but I'm going to still put it up there because I want to make it really, really clear, OK? <laughs> Let's make it really, really clear. So here's the same person doing the same work in a different way, right? It's a person who cannot say no, who cannot say wait, who cannot prioritize. So I'm paying this context switching price every day. Every day I got multiple stories or multiple projects, multiple tasks going on simultaneously, although they're not going on simultaneously because our brains can't do things simultaneously. So instead it's, uh, I'm jumping around, right? So here we go. I was planning to put these up there, but it doesn't stick here, so you'll just have to see, well, see it down here. Now, what's interesting about this picture? You got a lot of things. Well, first of all, we got the time to market, right? I started here, I finished three days later. I started here, I finished, what, two weeks later, right? So suddenly you got the same amount of work taken like five times longer, seven times longer, but you also got productivity difference. In this amount of time, this person, the focus person, could do another two projects, right? Or I could reiterate, I could add some hair to this one, right? Or whatever. Plus, I'm learning faster, so I'm going to produce better stuff. 
Plus, the multitasking causes stress, so this person will be happier and less stressful. And we know from the keynote yesterday, Jürgen, that happier people do better work, right? So there's just so many reasons for why we should try to create focus. And this applies to both uh, individuals, teams, departments. Look at how many projects you're working on at the same time. Look in your calendar. Look at how many stories are in progress for the team, right? The right answer isn't always going to be one. I mean, this is a bit maybe exaggerated. But if you look at your multitasking, you're probably going to find that a lot of the context switch is just wasteful and un unnecessary. There's going to be some that we can't get away from, but a lot of it is, is really wasteful. So look for that, because what that is is free resources, right? It's people you don't have to hire. It's hours you don't have to work. It's kind of magical. Right? All right. That was the silly sticky note demo. Um, <clears throat> So, back to my story here. So I'm jumping around helping all these companies, and I was kind of getting stuck in this quite a lot because uh, I couldn't say no, right? I, was, I, you know, I, I, was, I felt flattered. People said, hey, I read your book, it's awesome, come and help us, and I'm like, okay, I'm coming, right? Uh, the, the flattery thing is hard, hard, hard to resist. Um, but I noticed that I, I was really getting stressed out. Um, and as a consultant, sometimes you need, sometimes there's overflow, right? Sometimes uh, a gig will take longer than you thought, and then there's overflow, I gotta catch up an email, gotta prepare a talk. Where does the overflow go? Well, if, if, if the days are all booked up, the overflow goes into evenings and weekends, right? With four kids at home, it's just not nice. So I started thinking about the thing about Slack, because I noticed that, that um, I'm going to talk more about Slack, what I really mean by that, but what I noticed was that Slack is a really powerful thing, and it really helps teams and organizations work faster if they put Slack into their system. So I started thinking about, well, I'm, I'm not practicing what I preach. I've got to try this on, on, on myself. So I, so I did an experiment. I, I went to my calendar, and I just took one day per week, and I wrote Slack on it <laughs> for like three months ahead. And I told myself that Slack means, it doesn't mean I'm not working. It just means I don't decide ahead of time what I'm going to do that day. I wake up in the morning, and we'll see what happens, right? Maybe it's going to be email. Maybe it's going to be preparing a talk. Maybe it's going to be playing a game or making music or just bumming around. It's going to vary, right? But the point is, it's empty. It's not client time. It was an experiment. I was prepared to, to uh, have, have less income. Um, but what happened was really interesting, because suddenly I was forced to prioritize better, right? I didn't have five days per week. I only had four. I was forced to prioritize better. And a lot of really good stuff started happening from this. A lot of surprising good stuff started happening personally for me, but also for my clients. So after a while, I increased it to two. <laughs> so now for the past seven years, I've had this habit a uh, uh, half year in, in advance, I just go to my calendar, I put in two days of Slack every week, like that. The days can move. It doesn't have to be that particular day, it can move a little bit. Sometimes I'm going to sacrifice a day, maybe two, because something happened, something makes it worth it. But then it's Slack days being uh, sacrificed and not, not evenings and, and weekends. But prioritization, really interesting. Because I thought about it, I wrote this darn book in a weekend. You don't normally write a book in a weekend, that's, that's not normal, right? Well, why? Well, hyperfocus. Do you have to be sick to get hyperfocus? That's stupid. Can I create space in, instead? And what started happening during those two days was a lot of stuff started coming out. I created this video called Agile Pro Product Ownership in a Nutshell, which is even now, like eight years later, totally viral. I, I realized that when, when I have this time, when, when, I, when I reserve Slack time and I have less client time, then I have to prioritize better. And when you have to prioritize, that forces you to make a decision, what's important, right? I have less available client time. What's important to me? So I had to make that really clear. And as a result, I could prioritize clients that I could actually make a big difference at, clients that are really interesting. And because I can make a big difference, I would learn more. And because I had Slack days, I would have time to write about that, right? Maybe prepare a talk about it. And then that spread, and things started coming out. Um, book on Kanban, or this book, Lean from the Trenches, about, about scaling. This was written mostly on a, on a plane from, from Sweden to Portland. Um, Spotify engineering culture videos, all these things that never, never would have happened if I didn't have that piece of slack. And my, my focus, my, my prioritization at the time was really helping companies improve. It's like, I want, I want to debug, refactor, optimize companies, right? Help companies improve. And I've realized that some of the most high-impact things I've done in terms of helping companies improve have been these things that happen kind of by accident. So th the way I think of focus and flow is that you can't schedule it. I don't know if I'm going to produce anything during the next Slack day, but it's like you create space. You, you create a place for flow to happen. So I think of it kind of like, 
suddenly a flow train shows up. You have an idea in your head like, hmm, there's something I learned there. I want to write an article about it, right? And you either catch the train or not. If you don't catch a train, it's gone. It's probably not coming back. But in my case, if it happens to coincide with a Slack day, then I might just sit down and do it, and I can get that done in one day because I'm catching the flow train. So it's like a kind of hyper-productivity. It, it doesn't always happen, but it's about uh, creating a space to enable it to happen. And what I've noticed is it's the same at companies. Uh, speaking of Spotify, we have this thing called a Hack Week. That, 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 well, that is our way to kind of put in an, an, an explicit, here's some Slack. You can do whatever the heck you want for a week. We do it twice per year. We started it as an experiment, and then now it's become institu institutionalized. We do it twice per year, the whole company, a week of do whatever the heck you want, and then we have demos at, at, the, at the end of the week. Ideally, teams will find their own Slack anyway. They will make sure they have time. But sometimes teams are, you know, they just want to deliver and they want to execute and they're stressed. This hack week creates a bit of explicit permission to just do whatever the heck you feel like. Um, right. So over the years, I've realized that personally, I'm a bit of a, a flow junkie. I realized the thing that I really love to do is just finding flow, whatever it is, making a song or just uh, drawing or, or playing a game or writing an article or even right now uh, holding a talk, right? Flow, uh, flow to me is when you're 100% focused on one thing. And to me, that's almost like a, like a drug, right? <laughs> so I've become dependent on these slack days. And what I've noticed is whenever I get stressed out, start losing control of things, I did root cause analysis. It always boils down to, oh shit, <laughs> I didn't follow my own principles. I better start doing that again, right? So I'm not necessarily good at following these principles, but I've noticed that when I do, it, it's great. I'm happier and I, and I do a better job. So it's like a bit of a cycle for me up and down, realizing that shit, I better start doing that again. Then I do it, then I stop doing it and realize, shit, I better do it again. <laughs> but okay, um, let's fast forward a, a, a little bit more. And at some point I realized I was traveling quite a lot. And traveling is fun. You get to see a lot of interesting places. But I had kids at home, and I felt that traveling is fun, but being away from my family is not fun. Hmm. What can I do? Any, 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 any ideas? <laughs> Travel with kids, maybe. Uh, I was talking to my wife, and we're like, hmm, if we could do anything, what would we do, right? That's the classic right, co coaching question you should ask yourself from time to time. If you could do anything, what would you do? Like, hmm, what about like a, a big trip, right? We would just travel like for a year or half a year. Like, wow, that would be really cool. And we're like, ah, that would be cool, but we can't do that, of course, because, and this long list of because came out, right? We can't because of school, because of this or that, because you know, it's going to cost a lot of money and got a client engagements and we don't have time, right? <laughs> don't have time. And we're like, yeah, no, can't. But then we had this follow-up question. Um, if we were to do it sometime, when would be the right time? And we're like, wait a sec. Well, we can't wait. I mean, the kids at the time were one, three, five, and seven years old. If we wait, there's going to be more and more kids who are in school. It gets harder. And are we going to wait 15 years until they're all out of school? Well, then they're not going to want to join us probably, right? So we're like, we either do it now or we, or we do it never. That was our very clear decision point. We do it now or we do it never. Like, well, never seems kind of boring. <laughs> so let's do it. So we decided that let's take this list of impediments and just turn it into a to-do list. So that became a Kanban board uh, at home. Just a, all these things that... Excuses for not being able to do it, just turn it into to-dos. Figure out school, figure out what to do with the clients, figure out what to do with the house, figure out what to do with it, you know, etc. And we set a date. A constraint is really important. So we set a date nine months later. To, we're going to leave. Whatever happens, we're going to leave that date. Bang, right? Really interesting what kind of focus that, that creates. We had no idea how we're going to sort this out, but we knew we were going to leave. Um, all right. What we also did was, was create a vision, which helped a lot. We had all of us got together, and, and the, the kids also went, just went to Google, started Googling images, printing out the ones that we found inspiring. We're like, ah, this would be what we hope the photo album looks like afterwards. We had pictures of like mountains and you know, just these different things. One of the kids put up a picture of a double-decker bus, like, that would be the coolest thing in the world. Like, okay, sure. Um, it wasn't a, that wasn't a to-do list, it was, it was just a vision, but it was a way of kind of guiding our, our planning, like what which places would we go to that would fulfill this? Which places could we go to where I could get a little bit of work to get some income? Anyway, um, it happened, and it worked out a lot better than I ever could have thought. We did this trip for we traveling for half a year and, and came back, and, and to my surprise, the, our, our photo gallery looked surprisingly similar to, to what we had as a vision. And I was like, wow, this, this would never have, never have happened if we hadn't just decided to do it, uh, even though we had n no idea. And I'm really glad, because now it's a, it's a bit trickier to travel. Um, I, I try to make a habit of bringing one or two kids when I can, like, like now, um, but it doesn't always work out. When I came back to Sweden, 
calendar was empty. So that, that was a really nice situation, empty calendar. Got to decide what to work on from scratch. So again, prioritization, right? Now I, I don't have to be just reactive, I can be proactive. So I started really thinking about what do I really want to do? Uh, I want to help the good guys win. I want to help the companies that I really like. I want to help them succeed. I started getting really focused and working with those companies and working with fewer companies at a time. I wanted to get away with this multitasking stuff. Before, I was just bouncing around, right? Not really seeing the consequences of any of the advice I was giving. So that ended up me getting more focused. I've spent now almost six years or five years focused mostly on Spotify, late two years a lot on, on Lego. So Spotify and Lego, I'm splitting my time between these two companies and learning so much and it's super interesting. Although I really have to keep those slack days or I'll just stress out again, right? <laughs> really important. All right. Um, the, the big learning here is, is the, the calendar. You own the calendar, right? I told you about these hours, they're yours. You might feel like you don't. Oh, but I have to do this after that, after this, right? I got all these commitments, you know, I got a nine to five job. But think about it. You're not, you're not as irreplaceable as you think, <laughs> right? If you suddenly disappear, is the company gonna die? Maybe in some case, but probably not. It didn't happen to me those times when I just suddenly had to leave. And think about it, if you think you're really, really busy, you got all this important stuff to do, and suddenly you get a call from the hospital, right? And your child is in the hospital, injured, something happened. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna say, well, book an appointment. <laughs> I might come next week, I have a slot here, <laughs> right? No, you're gonna clear your calendar, you're just gonna go, right? So clearly you do own your time, you just have to decide whether to take ownership or not. And that boils down, again, to uh, priorities. So for me, the trick, Putting Slack days in forced me to prioritize. It's not the only way, there are other ways, of, of course. But yeah, that's, that's been a very big learning. You've heard of the law of two feet? Hand up if you've heard of the law of two feet from open space. It says, um, if you're not learning or contributing or having fun, that's my own addition. If you're not learning or contributing or having fun where you stand right now, use your two feet, go somewhere else where you can learn or contribute or have fun. Uh, it's, it's a great principle for a conference. I realize it also applies to life, right? <laughs> Law of two feet apl applies to life. So it's really useful to think about what is important to me? What is really important to me? And then look at your calendar and say, well, and is the stuff I'm spending time on, does that match what I think is really important or, or, or not? If not, you know, do something because no one else is, right? <laughs> um, I, I find a, a useful assumption is that most of your time is wasted. It might sound a bit depressing, but you know, bear with me here, right? If you assume that most of your time is wasted, I don't mean wasted as in not being productive. If you're sitting at home playing a game and having fun, that's not wasted time, you're having fun, right? What I mean by wasted time is either doing the wrong thing, doesn't match your values, doesn't match your priorities, or doing the right thing in an ineffective way. For example here, maybe these are three projects that were really the right projects to work on, but we're doing it like really ineffectively. And I'm gonna uh, do a little demo that illustrates um, another way this happens. And for that, I'm going to need um, five volunteers to come up here. So five volunteers, and I'm going to need two kids. You want to join me? Great. Five adults and two kids. All right. Cool. We got four, and I need one more. That's great. Give him a hand for stepping up, right? <laughs> so, so here's the deal. We're going to do this little simulation. And, and uh, you're going to simulate some kind of team. And um, Emma and Peter here are our are, are customers, right? And what they want is Lego on this brick right here. So show it to people. Hold it up, right? That. We want Lego here. It's empty, right? <laughs> so um, Emma, maybe you stand over here, right? And the way we simulate that is, I'm gonna pass a brick in, and then you just pass it through all 10 hands and give it to Emma. Just pass it through all 10. And so this represents all the five people doing their part of the job, right? And then she's gonna deploy it. Cool, give her, give her a hand, right? Great, yes, cool, right? Let's build another one, if you can do this one. It's gotta go through all 10 hands, just pass it along. It's a little complicated, but they've managed to figure it out, right? Cool, that's great, yes. This time I want you to count how long time it takes, how many seconds, count loud, all right? Count.
Okay, so six or maybe seven seconds, right, is how long we, we've, we've baselined our process. Now the lean people will be overjoyed, right? Great. <laughs> um, this time I, I'd like you to pause. This time I'm going to pause in the middle, so you don't need to count. I'm going to pause, and when I say freeze, you just freeze, right? Pause. This is what the manager sees when the manager comes in. Just snapshot, right? Moment in time. Mmm. And then I run off to a meeting, right? Okay, keep working. Okay. Pause. Pause. <laughs> manager comes back, opens the door. This is, the, is kind of what the manager sees every time. What is the manager thinking? Look at all these people. They're lazy, right? They're just standing there. We're paying them a lot of money. And every time I open the door, there's just one holding a brick with one hand, right? That's 10% resource utilization. This is horrible, right? We need better, better bang for the buck. We need better resource utilization, right? Good, let's fix that. Okay, let's reset the exercise. Let's put the bricks back again. So, can you put the bricks there? Yeah, inside there. Cool. Uh, and uh, they've now brought in a consultant. Ah, consultants. They're, they fix things, right? And this consultant is gonna keep everybody busy. Just make sure uh, each brick has to go through all 10 hands, all right? Are you ready? Okay, so get to work. Build this one, build that one, wait. Well, we got, we got a resource uh, available over here. Well, oh, sorry, Peter. Wait, we got a resource availability over there. We got there, this one. Okay, uh, there's a resource, oops, uh, available. Pause, freeze. Okay, wait a sec, stay paused. Looking at the timesheet here, I see we have some available uh, capacity there and here and there. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Great. <laughs> so they're frozen, right? The manager opens the door, and what does the manager see? Yeah! We have 100% resource utilization, right? It's great. It's perfect. And what does Emma say? <laughs> the, Right? It's empty. Show them. Show them the thing. It's, it's like, where's my, where's my thing, right? Nothing. You recognize this problem? See this, right? It's what happens when, what, what happens when you optimize for, for, for busyness. What do you get? You get a lot of busy people, right? <laughs> this is what happens in your head when you, when, you, when you multitask, when you stress. A lot of work, not a lot of output, right? This is what happens in a traffic system when you've got too many cars in it. Right? Every piece of the road is utilized, but track cars aren't getting anywhere. This is what happens in your computer when your CPU is running at 100%. Is that good, when your, when your CPU is running at 100%? But you paid a lot of money for the computer and you're getting a lot of bang for the buck, aren't you? It's working hard, right? No, it's, it's really slow. So the purpose is not to keep people busy or to keep the systems busy. You want some slack in the system so you can get flow, right? So let's do another version of it, if you can put all the pieces back in there for now. I'm gonna do one more demo. See, there's this magical trick, and it really is quite cool. It's called pull. And the way that works is, if you stand here, right, and just hold it like that, and grab one piece, and just pass it along, and then just grab another one, right? And just keep doing that. You don't need to wait, just keep grabbing them, right? So what do you see now? Tell me, what do you see? Slow. That's about it's the same six or seven seconds as before, right? If you just look at any one brick, it's about as fast as before. Isn't it? Keep pulling, right? Just keep pulling. What if I were to tell you that the red pieces are worth twice as much? That he's prioritizing. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? You can prioritize. And we get just enough resource utilization. It's a little more than before, but it's not 100%, right? And we get the ability to reprioritize, which is otherwise known as Agile. <laughs> a lot of good stuff happens when you do a pull. Pull is built into Scrum, for example. Sprint planning meeting is a pull event. Pull is built into Kanban, right? Via whip limits. Thank you very much. Give him a hand, right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Drop it there. All right. There we go. Pretty nice, huh? There we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Emma. Always bring personal assistance. <laughs> All right. So I've noticed this interesting trend going on in, in companies, this, this kind of evolutionary pattern, right? Where, especially big companies, where they initially focus a lot on hours, 
and resource utilization. And you get this problem that I, that I just showed, right? You get uh, time reports, you get measuring and budgeting around hours. Um, gradually, they, they move to this notion of, actually, it's not, a, it's not about hours. In fact, if we can work less hours and deliver the same amount of stuff, that's even better. So less hours is, is better. So they start focusing on output. And you get things like velocity, right? You get things like cycle time. Those kind of metrics start getting interesting. And that's one step better, right? If we can get the same output with less work, great. But that's not the point either, though, right? Velocity is just a measure of how much stuff we deliver. Is it any good, though? So the next step in that path of evolution, and unfortunately, some get stuck in that second step, right? The third step in that path of evolution is, you know, it's not really about how much we deliver, it's about the value of it, right? If I can deliver better stuff, maybe I have a low velocity, but the stuff I deliver is really valuable. So those companies aren't as interested in things like velocity, cycle time. It's useful, but it's not the primary thing. They're very interested in measuring things like customer satisfaction, for example, looking at things like revenue. They use A-B testing to find out the actual impact of, of the work they do. They focus on learning. What, what can we deliver to learn faster? Right? Just a different way of thinking. But anyway, um, let's start uh, wrapping this up. So again, this thing about Slack, um, I find it makes a really big impact both in my own life but also in, in clients, but it is a bit counterintuitive. If you're really scared of Slack, if you have a company that is really scared of people not having much work to do right now, then you're going to be stuck with all these bricks, right? And you're going to be stuck in this model because here there is a bigger risk that you don't have anything to do because what if you finish with customer orange and you have a customer pink doesn't show up that day? You get a bit of Slack. Right? But down here, you've got three projects running concurrently. There's always going to be something to do somewhere. Right? So if you really want to be busy, multitasking is, is, is the solution. Right. Anyway, um, OK, so in summary, Slack is, is, is a bit of a, a, I don't like the word too much. I can't think of a better one, because it sounds like it's just bumming around being lazy. But to me, I think of it not as being lazy. I think of it as capacity that is unallocated. Right? We do just-in-time allocation of, of that capacity. Um, I see it as a place where you provide space for innovation to happen, a space for flow to happen, and a space for recovery, and a space for overflow to happen. Just a, a lot of benefits to it. Um, and it's, in summary, I'm going to put up the, the single one slide from this, which because people tend to forget everything that happens in a talk except the last thing, right? So here's the one slide. You ready? All right, it's big. Can you see it? Can you see it in the back? Yeah? All right. There's a lot to be said about focus. I think of it kind of like there's these ingredients you put into the soup. These aren't the only ingredients, but they're definitely the starting point. Without these, you're probably not going to find it. Create Slack. You can do that intentionally. It doesn't have to be two days per week. It can be half a day, whatever. Just go to your calendar, put it in, right? Same thing with a team. Between sprints, maybe you put a half a day, right? Unallocated time. Saying no, because if you can't say no, none of the stuff I talked about works. Right? If you can't say no, you're stuck with all these bricks. If you can't say no, you're stuck here. So you need to be able to say no. And in order to be able to say no, you need to have some kind of prioritization mechanism. You need to know what to say no to. Right? And finally, yeah, let's stop the I don't have time nonsense, right? So how many of you are willing to do an experiment and for, let's say, one month, never say the word, I don't have time? Hand up if you're willing to try that. Right? Cool. That, that, wow, that's actually a lot. Great. So yeah, thank you and good luck.